Hello everybody, this video is on investigations to measure the enthalpy of neutralization. By way of review, as we discussed in a previous video, the, the enthalpy of neutralization is always exothermic, and this is due to the formation of a covalent bond when hydroxide ions and hydrogen ions are neutralized to form a molecule of water. Every time the covalent bond is formed in a new molecule of water, some amount of energy is released and this energy is referred to as the enthalpy of neutralization. The enthalpy of neutralization is usually written as the delta H equals to minus, let's say, 57 kilojoules per mole, which means that 57 kilojoules of energy would be released for every one mole of water that's released. So therefore, the total amount of energy that will be released on the neutralization reaction depends on the number of moles of water molecules that is actually formed from neutralization. If you have a reaction that forms more moles of water, then you will end up releasing more energy. Conversely, if you form less water molecules from neutralization, you will release less energy. Calorimetry is an experiment that you can use to investigate or measure the enthalpy change of neutralization. Calorimetry involves the monitoring and use of temperature change of the reaction mixture to calculate Q, which is the energy that is absorbed by the final solution of the neutralization mixture. It is important here to understand that although neutralization is an exothermic reaction where it releases energy, this energy would be then absorbed by the solution itself, which is then measured by an increase in temperature using a thermometer. In calorimetry, we use a very specialized insulated vessel to contain the reaction mixture in order to reduce the amount of energy loss to the surrounding. This ensures that the temperature increase that we measure using the thermometer more accurately reflects the amount of energy that is absorbed by the solution. So in this experiment, our dependent variable will be the change in temperature. And by using the heat capacity and the known mass of the final solution, we can then find the value of Q, which is the energy that is absorbed by the solution. If we assume that the energy absorbed by the solution is exactly equal to the energy released by neutralization, we can then use the same number of Q in this equation to find the enthalpy change of neutralization. This is by dividing Q by N, where N is the number of moles of water. We are dividing by the number of moles of water because enthalpy change of neutralization is defined as the amount of energy produced per mole of water that is formed. In this equation, we also should add a negative in front because originally Q is a positive number as it measures the temperature increase of the solution. So if we want to use the number here to calculate the change in enthalpy, we need to add a negative as this represents the amount of energy that is released by neutralization. In other words, Q in the first formula, Q equals to mc delta T, represents the energy that is absorbed by the solution, whereas the Q in the second formula, when we're trying to calculate the enthalpy change of neutralization, refers to the energy released by neutralization, hence why we add a negative in front to calculate the enthalpy change. When you're performing this experiment using a calorimeter, it is important to understand and be aware of all the assumptions that you make in order to measure the enthalpy of neutralization. The main assumption we are making here is that no energy that is released by neutralization is lost to the surrounding. Now the surrounding includes anything but the solution. So the surrounding air can also take up energy, which is not accounted for by the thermometer. And also we are assuming that no energy, despite using an insulated vessel, is dissipated from the solution. In calorimetry, the reaction releases some amount of energy, and we are assuming that all of this energy is absorbed by the solution, which is what we are measuring the temperature change of. However, you need to be aware that in real life, some amount of this energy will be lost to the surrounding, which includes the surrounding air around the vessel. And once the energy has been taken up and absorbed by the solution, it can also be dissipated to the surrounding. Of course, by using an insulated vessel, we are minimizing the amount of energy dissipated from the solution. 
The second assumption that we are making is that the specific heat capacity of the solution is often difficult to quantify. So for most calculation questions and experiments, we assume that the heat capacity of the solution is the same as pure water, which is 4.18 times 10 to the power of 3 joules per kelvin per kilogram. Now, of course, this sometimes is not a bad assumption because the concentration of the solutes in the final solution may be so dilute that it's pretty much the same as pure water. The third assumption is that the density of the final solution is the same as pure water. This is often used to calculate the final mass of the solution when neutralization has taken place. The density of pure water is 1 gram per 1 mil. I'll demonstrate how we can use this density in the subsequent calculation. 10 milliliters of 2 moles per liter hydrochloric acid is added to 50 milliliters of 2 moles per liter of sodium hydroxide solution. Both solutions were at an initial temperature of 25 degrees Celsius, and the resulting solution reached the maximum temperature of 36.5 degrees Celsius. So using this information, let us calculate the molar enthalpy of reaction between hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide. So this is of course the enthalpy of neutralization and we'll state any of the assumptions made. So like all questions, let's write a balanced chemical equation to represent the neutralization between these two compounds. So this will produce sodium chloride as a salt and water molecule. In this experiment, we have already found the change in temperature, which goes from 25 degrees to 36.5 degrees. So if we subtract the two numbers, we'll calculate the increase in temperature, which is about 11.5 degrees Celsius. And this is the same as 11.5 kelvins, as we are dealing with a change in temperature. We can then use the formula of Q equals to mc times by delta T to find the amount of energy that was absorbed by the solution. M is mass of the final solution, C is the heat capacity of the solution, and then of course delta T is the change in temperature. To find the mass of the final solution, we'll need to make our first assumption, which is that the density of the final solution is the same as pure water, which is 1 gram per 1 milliliter. The final volume of the solution will be a combination of 10 milliliters and 15 milliliters, which is a total of 25 milliliters. Using the density of 1 gram per 1 mil, that means the mass of 25 milliliters will be equivalent to 25 grams. So this will be the mass that we use in our formula. The specific heat capacity of the solution is now given to us, but we can make a second assumption and say that the heat capacity of the solution is the same as pure water, which is 4.18 times 10 to the power of 3 joules per kilogram of the solution per Kelvin. So then we can use the formula and say Q is equal to mass. The mass here would be 0.025 kilograms. I'm using kilograms of mass here because the unit for the specific capacity is in joules per kilogram of the solution. If this was per grams, then you can use the mass here in the units of grams. So we times by the heat capacity of 4.18 times 10 to power 3 and also times by the temperature change of 11.5. And this gives me a total energy absorbed by the solution of 1210.75 joules. And this is absorbed by the solution. Now, before we continue, we need to make a third assumption, which is that assume there's no energy lost to the surrounding, which means the amount of energy that is released by the neutralization will be minus 1210.75 joules. Now to find the enthalpy change, of course we divide the amount of energy that's released by the reaction by the number of moles of water. So this is where we have to take a step back and consider the number of moles of the reactants that's used before we can calculate the amount of water. So the moles of hydrochloric acid is given by its concentration of 2 moles per litre multiplied by the volume of 0.01 litres which gives you 0.02 moles. And similarly, the moles of sodium hydroxide can be worked out in by multiplying its concentration by its volume, which gives us 0.03 moles. Since the acid and base react in the one-to-one -one ratio, 
the hydrochloric acid here is clearly the limiting reagent and will determine the number of moles of water that will be formed. The ratio between the acid and the water is also in a one-to-one -one ratio, which means the number of moles of water that will be produced by this neutralization is 0.02 moles. Now we found the moles of water, we can then use this number in my enthalpy change equation to find the enthalpy of neutralization. So this is equal to minus 1 to 1, 0 0.75 joules divided by 0 0.02 moles of water, which gives me an answer of 6.01 times 10 to the power of 4 joules per mole. Since the fewest number of significant figures of the numbers I've given this question is 3, I'll leave this as three significant figures. Alternatively, you can also choose to convert the unit from joules per mole into kilojoules per mole by dividing by a thousand. So if we divide this number by a thousand, I'll get minus 60.1 kilojoules per mole. And I'll also leave this answer as three significant figures. When you're doing any experiment, it's important to understand the validity, accuracy, and reliability of the experiment and its results. As we discuss extensively, there are numerous assumptions that we've made in this investigation. These assumptions will affect both the validity and the accuracy of your results. The validity and accuracy of your, of your enthalpy change that you calculated uh, will be both limited by the extent of energy lost to the surrounding. If there's more energy lost to the surrounding air, for example, then the temperature increase that you've measured using your calorimeter will not accurately reflect the actual amount of energy that was released by neutralization. So this not only makes your experimental value different or more deviated from the actual value, making it more inaccurate, it also makes your experimental design flawed in that you will never be able to obtain the actual value of enthalpy change. So that decreases the validity of your experiment. To improve the validity and accuracy of your experiment results, you should try to minimize the energy loss. And in calorimetry, this is the reason why we use an insulated vessel. We can also make the result more valid and accurate by using the exact mass of the final solution, instead of making the assumption that the density of the solution is the same as water, and using the specific heat capacity value of the final solution instead of using the value for pure water. Doing both of these things will make your result more accurate and also the experiment more valid. Like most other investigations, the reliability of your results can be assessed by repeating the experiment using the same method. The results are said to be reliable if repeated values are consistent or similar. This concludes the video on calorimetry and investigating the enthalpy of neutralization.